Welcome back to this undergraduate statistics course. Today we'll be discussing probability distributions and more generally, we'll be discussing the basics of probability theory. Just enough for an undergraduate statistics course. Now the very first thing that we have to do is to define the concept of probability. And surprisingly, how you define probability matters a whole lot. Within the context of this course, whenever we discuss probability, we are talking about the long run probability. And the long run probability applies to any random experiment that you could theoretically repeat very many times, maybe an infinite number of times. And probability in this context is the proportion of those infinite times in which you would expect to see a particular outcome. This raises the question, what do we mean by a random experiment? So a random experiment is any procedure that could be repeated where the outcome is not fixed. Classically, a coin flip is an example of a random experiment. So what is not a random experiment? Well, something that is unknown, but that could not theoretically be repeated very many times is not a random experiment. So for example, the question of whether or not I'm wearing matching pants with this suit jacket is not a probability statement. It's either 100% or 0%. The only difference is you don't know which one of those is true. And the same applies to a particular coin flip. So if I flip a coin right here and I look at the outcome and I know the outcome, but you don't, that's not a random experiment. It's a fixed outcome, but you don't know what the outcome is. I will briefly acknowledge the existence of other definitions of probability, most notably Bayesian probability, which assigns a subjective likelihood to each potential outcome. And that's outside of the scope of this course, but it allows you to do some really cool things. So here are some examples of probabilities in real life. For example, the probability of a baby being assigned the male sex at birth is 0.51. The probability of rolling a seven in Catan, which I believe involves moving the robber, is 0.17 or about 17%. And again, there are also things that you can't assign a probability to. For example, the probability of there being life on a specific other planet. That's not a random experiment, so we cannot assign probability to it. The probability is either 100% or 0% if there's no life on that planet. The only thing is we don't know the truth of the situation. So now that we've discussed probability and random experiments, I also want to introduce the idea of a random variable. Very important, I want to disambiguate this from the concept of a variable as we discussed it last week. Last week we talked about variables as placeholders for specific numbers. So I can talk about the variable height and that's a placeholder for the specific height of people in my sample. Here we're talking about a random variable and one example is that outcome of a coin toss. The outcome of a coin toss is a random variable with a probability of 0.5 for heads and 0.5 for tails. Together, 0.5 and 0.5 make one whole. And this is true for all probability distributions. They sum to one. And practically speaking, that means it is 100% certain that some outcome will occur. And in the case of a coin flip, 50% of the time that outcome will be heads and 50% of the time that outcome will be tails. And we can extend this idea of a coin flip to other discrete probability distributions. And let me call back a topic that we discussed last week, which is the frequency distribution. I introduced the frequency distribution as a descriptive statistic, and they summarize the observed outcomes in a sample. For example, I could make a frequency distribution of the number of Dutch versus non-Dutch students in this class. A probability distribution is very similar to a frequency distribution, except I can use it to estimate how likely it is that a randomly selected future student will also be either Dutch or not Dutch. For discrete outcomes, we talk about probability mass functions. There are two outcomes and each of those has a particular probability mass. For example, the probability mass for a student being non-Dutch might be 0.3 or 30%, and the probability mass for a student being Dutch might be 0.7 or 70%. Notice that I use probability and percentages pretty much interchangeably. If you multiply a probability by 100%, you get the percentage. What's distinctive about discrete probability distributions is that, that there's always a finite number of potential outcomes. So a student can either be Dutch or not Dutch. A student can either have a tattoo or not have a tattoo. And you can describe these probability distributions with a bar chart or a contingency table. 
And as we discussed last week, a contingency table also allows you to summarize two discrete variables together. And that's what we're doing here. So what you see on the screen is an idealized contingency table. And we have two discrete variables. One is represented by the rows and one is represented by the columns. So we have four potential combinations of values. And we can index this table, that means telling other people which cell to look at, by row, and there we use the index i. So for example, if I want you to look in row two, I would say, look at index i equals two. And we can index columns using the letter j. So if I want you to look at the second row and the second column, I would say, look at the cell for which i equals two and j also equals two. So in that cell, we find f sub i comma j, the frequency in the cell in row i and column j. So in this case, that's f sub two comma two. Importantly, we can also calculate the marginal total across the rows, and that's in the margin rows. And if we look in the margin for the rows, we see that the first marginal total sums across the first row, the second marginal total sums across the second row, and we also have marginal totals for the columns. Those are at the bottom line of this table. So there we see that the first marginal total sums across column one and the second marginal total sums across column two. And we get an overall total, F sub plus comma plus, and that is the total of observations in our data set. Now, the reason that this is important is because those marginal and overall totals allow us to calculate different probabilities from a contingency table. So let's fill in some numbers in this contingency table. Let's say that we're cross-tabulating whether students are Dutch or not against whether they have a tattoo or not. So here in orange, you see the marginal or univariate frequency distribution for the variable tattoo, which you obtain just by taking the column totals for the variable tattoo. So here we see that there are 40 students who don't have a tattoo and 34 who do have a tattoo. In the other margin along the rows, we find the univariate marginal frequency distribution for nationality. So here we see that there are 21 foreign students and 53 Dutch students. We can also obtain the conditional frequency distribution. For example, we can say, given that we only look at Dutch students, how many students don't or do have a tattoo? And those are the numbers indicated here in purple. So given that we're only looking at Dutch students, 24 of them did not have a tattoo and 29 of them did have a tattoo. And finally, we can look at the joint frequency distribution. And in the case of two discrete binary variables, there's only one value for the joint frequency. And this answers the question, how many people were both Dutch and had a tattoo? And in this case, the purple number gives us the answer, it's 29 people. It's quite easy to calculate different probabilities from frequency distributions. All you have to do is divide by an appropriate total. So let's have a quick look at that. We can easily convert marginal frequency distributions to probability distributions just by dividing by the global total. So in this example, the global total of 74 is highlighted in orange. We had 74 total participants. And we see the marginal frequency distribution for the variable Dutch. There were 21 international students and 53 Dutch students. If we divide those 23 and 53 by the global total, then we obtain the marginal probability distribution. If we randomly select students from this sample, there's a probability of 28% that we randomly select an international student and a probability of 72% that we randomly select a Dutch student. And in mathematical notation, we indicate the probability of being Dutch as follows, P between parentheses Dutch. Perhaps more interesting is to calculate conditional probability distributions. And the conditional probability distribution being calculated here is the probability of having a tattoo given that you are Dutch. And the mathematical notation for this is P behind parentheses of having a tattoo given that, which is what this bar signifies, given that you are Dutch. So P of tattoo bar Dutch, the probability of having a tattoo given that you are Dutch. And to obtain this probability distribution, we don't divide by the global total, but we divide by the row total of the condition that we're interested in. 
So in this case, there were 53 Dutch students. So we divide the frequencies of Dutch students who didn't or did have a tattoo by the total number of Dutch students, highlighted in orange. And finally, we can calculate the joint probability of a particular outcome. And the joint probability is indicated by this symbol that looks a little bit like an N. This means the intersection of two variables. In this case, we're interested in the intersection of being Dutch and having a tattoo. A mnemonic device that may be useful for this course is to just think of this little N symbol as meaning and. So you could say to yourself, I'm looking for the probability of being Dutch and having a tattoo. And then we come to a frequency of 24. And for the joint probability, again, you have to divide by the global total. So we divide by 74. And the joint probability of being Dutch and having a tattoo is 32%. As we discussed last week, we don't always work with discrete variables, there are also continuous variables. And for continuous variables, it's not really possible to assign a particular probability mass to particular values, because continuous variables can take on any possible value. So what we do instead is we describe the likelihood of observing different values with a probability density function, and that's a continuous function. The surface area underneath this function defines the probability. In technical terms, we're talking about the integral or the area under the curve. There are very many different probability density functions, but in this course, we introduce you to the most widely used one. It's so widely used, in fact, that people call it the normal distribution. You can see an example of it in the bottom of the slide, and its defining features are that it's bell-shaped, it's symmetrical, so the left half is identical to the right half, and it runs along the number line from minus infinity to plus infinity. We can describe what a normal distribution looks like with just two numbers, and we call these its parameters. The first number is the mean, which is signified by the Greek letter mu, and that tells us where the middle of this normal distribution is. And the second value is its standard deviation, which tells us how wide the normal distribution is. And as we discussed last week, you can understand the standard deviation as the average distance from the mean. So in this picture in the top left, you can see four examples of different normal distributions. And here we have some information about parameters. Let's try to find each of these distributions. There should be one distribution that has a mean around minus one and a standard deviation of 0.5. So we're looking for a skinny distribution whose center is below zero. So if I look in the picture, I think, well, that must be this orange distribution because its center is about minus one and it's pretty skinny. I can also look, for example, for distribution number three, which should have a mean of 0.5 and a standard deviation of 1.5. So its center should be above zero and it should be relatively wide distribution. So then I look here and I see that two distributions have a mean of 0.5 and one of them is wider than the other. So if I look in the table again, I see that these two distributions have a mean of 0.5 and the one that we're looking for is supposed to be the wider one with a standard deviation of 1.5. So that must be the magenta distribution over here. I'm going to teach you how to calculate probabilities using normal distributions. But in order to do so, it's convenient to get rid of information about the mean and the standard deviation. So we're always calculating with the same distribution. And this is called standardizing a variable. I've shown you four examples of specific normal distributions. Each of them had a different mean and a different standard deviation, but all of them have the same shape. They just have a different center and scale. We could get rid of that information about the center and the scale, and then we would obtain an ideal normal distribution. And we call this the standard normal distribution. Its defining features are that it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And because the variance is the squared standard deviation and one squared is still one, we can also say that it has a variance of one. And we signify the standard normal distribution with the Z score. And we also call it the Z distribution. So what we can say is that the Z distribution is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And we can take any normal distribution with a different mean and standard deviation, standardize it to the standard normal distribution, 
calculate probabilities, and then go back to the original scale of the variable. So why would we standardize these distributions? Well, it has a historical reason. It's really difficult to calculate the area under a continuous curve. So difficult that people didn't used to do it by hand. Rather, they would look up that area under the curve in a table in the back of their statistics books. And some of you might still be doing that either with a table in your book or with a table that we scanned from one of these books. Nowadays, of course, this is no longer necessary. Computers can give us with very high accuracy the area under the curve for any normal distribution. But still it's convenient to be familiar with the process of standardizing variables and using the standard normal distribution. Let's say we have a variable x. For example, people's height or intelligence or neuroticism. And we want to convert that variable to a standardized normal distribution. What we do is we calculate a z-score. So for particular values of x, we subtract the mean and then divide the result by the standard deviation. And that gives us a z-score that matches that particular x-score. So we can call this standardizing the value. And effectively what it does is it removes the original units of measurement. So if height was measured in centimeters, by standardizing the variable height, we lose the information about centimeters. If intelligence was measured in IQ points, by standardizing intelligence, we get rid of that unit of measurement as well. But we can always go back the other way and take a standardized z-score and convert it into a score in centimeters or a score in IQ points. And we do that by taking that z-score multiplying it by the standard deviation and adding the mean to it. Let's look at the properties of the standard normal distribution a little bit closer. As you can see, the mean is zero and the standard deviation is equal to one. So in this graph, we see one, two, three standard deviations above the mean and one, two, three standard deviations below the mean. Another property of any normal distribution, including the standard normal distribution, is that it's symmetrical. So the left side of the distribution is identical to the right side of the distribution. So that tells us that areas under the curve on the left side of the distribution are exactly the same size as that area on the right side of the distribution. For example, if we calculate the probability of observing a standardized normal z-score smaller than minus 1.64, we know that that is exactly the same as the probability of observing a z-score greater than plus 1.64. Those are the areas highlighted in orange in this graph. And both of those have a surface area of 0 0.05. In other words, the probability of observing a score higher than 1.64 is 5%. And the probability of observing a score lower than minus 1.64 is also 5%. A second property of normal distributions, including the standard normal, is that the total area under the curve is 1. And this matches what I told you before, that there is a 100% probability of some outcome occurring. But we can use this property to find areas by taking the complement. So for example, previously we calculated the probability of observing a z-score greater than 1.64, and that was 5%. And that area is now highlighted in red. But that also means that the probability of observing something other than greater than 1.64 is 1 minus 5%, is 95%. And the third property of the normal distribution is that areas under the curve can be added for example, we know that the probability of observing a score to the right of the mean is 50% or 0.5. So if we want to calculate the probability of observing a score greater than minus 0.5, all we have to do is calculate the probability area highlighted in red here and add 0.5 to it, which represents the entire right half of the distribution. So in this case, we want to know what's the probability of observing a z-score greater than minus a half. And to get that information, all we need to do is calculate the probability of observing a z-score between minus 0.5 and 0. And that probability is 
and we add 0.5 to it. So the total probability of observing a z-score greater than negative 0.5 is 69%. It's also very useful to memorize how likely it is to observe a score between plus one and minus one standard deviation or plus two and minus two standard deviations or plus three and minus three standard deviations. Why is this useful? Well, first of all, because it allows you to give a ballpark figure when someone asks you about the probability of observing particular scores. And second, because I like to use those values for exam questions so you don't spend all of your time calculating things. So the probability of observing a score between plus and minus one standard deviation is 68%. So that means that there's a 34% probability on the right side and a 34% probability on the left side. The probability of observing a score between plus and minus two standard deviations is already 95%. So that covers most scores, you would say. And the probability of observing a score between plus three and minus three standard deviations is 99.7. So that really covers almost all possibilities. So with this in mind, you should be very surprised when you observe a score that's greater than plus four standard deviations or smaller than minus four standard deviations. Another way to talk about probabilities is in terms of percentiles. So the percentile is defined as follows. The kth percentile is the score below which k percent of scores fall. So remember, for example, the median, which we introduced last week. And in a normal distribution, the median is identical to the mean. The median divides a sample exactly in half. And that means that it is also the 50th percentile because 50% of the scores are lower and 50% are higher. And we also have a special name for the 25th and the 75th percentile. We call these the first and the third quartile of the distribution. Of course, that name is based on one quarter and three quarters. So by extension of this logic, plus one standard deviation is the 84th percentile, 50% of cases are below the mean and 34% of cases are between the mean and plus one standard deviation. So if you add those, 50% plus 34% is 84. That's the 84th percentile. So let's apply this to a particular example. Let's say that IQ is normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And we know that this is true because this is how IQ is defined. We may then ask the question, what percentile corresponds to an IQ of 120 or lower? So first we have to calculate a z-score. And remember that we calculate a z-score by standardizing the IQ score. So we take this score of 120 and we subtract the mean of 100 and we divide by the standard deviation of 15. So that's 120 minus 100 is 20 divided by 15 is one and a third. So what's the probability of observing a z-score smaller than 1.33? Well, that probability is about 0.9. So this means an IQ of 120 corresponds to the 90th percentile. And you see that in this graph over here. This is the normal distribution for IQ scores. Its mean is 100. Its standard deviation is 15. And our 90th percentile is indicated by the green line over here that corresponds to an IQ of 120. And what you also see is here on the bottom, I've made a plot that's called a box plot. So a box plot indicates the median by this dark black line over here. It also indicates the 25th and the 75th percentiles. In other words, the first and the third quartiles. And it has these whiskers and the whiskers are 1.5 times the interquartile range. So that's the distance between the first quartile and the third quartile. And any score that's even greater than that is considered an outlier. And those are plotted separately as dots over here. These box plots are very often used to summarize the distribution of scores. And that brings me to the next topic, which is describing data with normal distributions. And this is actually the first example of statistical modeling in this course.
So in this slide, you see a histogram, which I introduced last week. It's a summary of continuous variables. What we see here are people's scores on the variable openness. And what we see is that most people scored around 140 on openness, and very few people scored lower than 100, and very few people scored higher than 170. You also notice, hopefully, that the histogram roughly follows a normal distribution. So what we could do is say, well, it looks pretty normal. We're just going to assume that this variable is normally distributed. Why would we do this? Well, because then we can describe the scores of our 501 participants with just two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. So now I can say, well, the mean in this sample is openness of 135 and the standard deviation is 15. In other words, any time you're reporting the mean and the standard deviation for a variable, you're implicitly assuming that those scores are well described by a normal distribution. Aside from conveniently being able to summarize the distribution with just the mean and standard deviation, this also allows us to perform probability calculus on that variable. But it is crucial to remember that all models can be wrong. And in this case, it could be that the normal distribution does not describe the distribution of scores very well. So in this slide, you see an example where this is the case. If we assume that these scores are normally distributed, then we would expect them to follow this black line over here. But what we see is that there are a lot of people who scored higher than the mean, and there are very few people who scored just below the mean. So in this case, the normal distribution is not a very good distribution to describe those data. And this reminds me of an old adage that is very often repeated. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So then the question arises, how wrong can you afford to be, right? Does it really matter if I report the mean and standard deviation for age, if age is not normally distributed? And that's a question that you have to think about. So if you are writing a paper, and you chose to represent your data with a normal distribution and report the mean and the standard deviation, but your observed data deviates substantially from the normal distribution, that's something that you might wanna discuss. So in this example, the mean, the standard deviation, and any probabilities that we calculate are going to misrepresent our data somewhat. So in this case, the model of using a normal distribution is not that useful. If this happens to you, so if your observed scores deviate from normality, there are two solutions. One solution is to pick a different probability distribution than the normal distribution. But unfortunately, that's outside of the scope of this course. And the second thing you can do is to comment in your paper or your report that the assumption of normality appears to be violated. So the final thing we'll do today is go over a few applied exercises. First, let's say that we're measuring neuroticism, and neuroticism is normally distributed with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. What is the probability that a randomly chosen person has a neuroticism score of 60 or higher? So in this case, you have to realize that the score of 60 is one standard deviation above the mean. And then we can think, hmm, one standard deviation above the mean is one of those standard values that I had you memorize. 34% of people are going to score between the mean and plus one standard deviation. And 50% of people are going to score below the mean. So we can say 50 plus 34, that's 84%. But the question is about 60 or higher. So we have to take 100 minus 84% and that is 16%. So there's a 16% probability of having a neuroticism score of 60 or higher. The second question is, complete the sentence, 95% of the population scores between mm-hmm and mm-hmm on neuroticism. So this is another one of those standard values that I had you memorize, and 95 corresponds to plus and minus two standard deviations. So that's gonna be 50 minus two times 10, is 30, and 50 plus two times 10 is 70. So 95% of the population will score between 30 and 70 on neuroticism. 
As a general rule, it's wise to take these steps whenever you're presented with a question about calculating probabilities and z-scores. The first step is always to draw the problem on a piece of scrap paper. The second thing to do is to check if the solution is close to a standard value that you memorized, like the mean or plus or minus one standard deviation. If it is not close to a standard value, then calculate the z-score manually and find the p-value for that z-score. And for this, you can either use a z-table, which is in the back of a statistics book and we'll make one available for you in the course materials. But you can also use, for example, an online calculator or you can use an Excel spreadsheet. And I will show you how to do this quickly using our previous example. So in the previous example, we were looking for the probability that a randomly chosen person had a neuroticism score of 60 or higher, and that corresponded to plus one standard deviation. So let's calculate the answer with an online calculator. So this is a website that evaluates simple scripts written in R. And in this case, what I want to know is the normal probability, that's what P norm means, for a z-score of one, in a distribution with mean zero, standard deviation one, and then I need to choose whether I want the lower tail probability or the upper tail probability. And in this case, I want the upper tail probability, the probability of having this score or higher. So I'm gonna set this to false. And if I run this code, then I get the correct answer, which is the probability is 16%. And you can also do this in an Excel spreadsheet. You just take an empty cell and you paste the formula from the slide. In this case, the function is called normdist, and I want to know the answer for a z-score of one in a distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. So this function only gives me the left-tailed probability, and it is 84%, so I have to do one minus this value and then again, I get the correct answer of 0.16. So now let's do a more difficult example. Assume that height is normally distributed with a mean of 180 and standard deviation of 20. What percentage of the, what percentage of the population is taller than 212 centimeters? So the first step is to draw the problem. So I'll draw a normal distribution and I'll draw approximately where 212 centimeters is. It's above the mean, but there's not really a standard solution because it doesn't exactly correspond to plus one standard deviation or plus two standard deviations. So I have to calculate the answer by hand. So step three is to calculate the z-score. And the z-score is the observed score, 212, minus the mean, 180, and divide the result by 20. So this is going to be 32 divided by 20 is 1.6. So now I need to find the p-value for a z-score of 1.6. And I want the p-value to the right of 1.6. So I can do this in Excel like I just showed you. And then I have to calculate 1 minus norm dist of 1.6 in a distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. Or I can use that online R calculator and then I ask for the p-norm of 1.6 in a distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. And I want the right tail probability, so I set lower tail to false. Or I can use a table in a book. And there I want the probability to the right of 1.6. So let's have a quick look at how you read one of these tables. This is a picture out of some statistics book. And what I'm looking for is the right tailed probability. So I'm looking in this column with a picture of the right tailed probability. And I'm looking for a z-score of 1.6, which is over here. And the right tailed probability is 0.055. So the conclusion is that 5.5% of the population is taller than 212 centimeters. You should definitely try to solve some of these problems yourself to better understand the concept of probability and to be well prepared for your exam. Take care.